question I want to ask you this morning is this. What is the church? If you have a bulletin on the inside, there's an insert, you can take notes. And this is a very important question. Because if we do not understand what the church is, we will not be effective. So let me read our text this morning and pray, and we'll jump right into it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Scripture says this, Jesus speaking, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now notice this, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against thee. Now if you know what a gate is, it's used as a defense mechanism. As a child, I always thought that Christ was building this thing, and we would need to isolate and protect ourselves from the evil or hell of this world. And God would protect this thing isolated over here. But that's not what the scripture is saying. He is saying that I am going to build something and empower this thing called the church and it becomes so incredibly offensive that it literally shakes the gates of hell. That is what Christ died to give us, his church. Pray with me. Lord, we love you and we thank you that we can meet together in this air-conditioned building, comfortable seating. Father, in a place and a country where we have freedom to worship openly, May we never take that for granted. But may we also understand that's not the end game. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would anoint this teaching this morning with your presence and your power. Like an ask, Father, when you, when you moved in the midst, lives were changed, people understood truth, and restoration came about. Father, please this morning, move in our midst as we look at what you're doing in the world through Jesus, and what Jesus is doing through his church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. To those that know my story, they know that I was adopted at about three days of age. When I was uh, younger, I used to tell people my parents found me out in an alley somewhere in a garbage can, and that explained why I was with this clan. Of course, that's not the case. God intervened in a mighty way, and my biological mother couldn't carry me. She was unmarried at the time, and so she wisely found an alternative option than, than abortion. She gave me to a wonderful family. And my, my parents are incredible people, God-fearing folks. And I like to tell people from the, the day of my birth that I was a drug baby. Jokingly, I tell people that I was a drug baby because I was drugged to Sunday school. I was drugged <laughs> to prayer meeting. I was drugged to anything that was going on at the church. In fact, there were two things my dad said. Don't ever forget, Todd. Don't ever forget your name, Weaver. And don't ever forget, if there's anything going on down at the church, we're going to be there. And boy, was he right. And the joke he used to always say, of course, I thought it was true, but he said, if they're going to have a rock-throwing contest at church, and the doors are open, we're there. And I, as a child, said, that, that doesn't make sense. Why would we go to the church to throw rocks? We can just throw rocks here. But the principle being, we are going to church. Now, the church building is so connected with the idea of church that we unconsciously equate the two as one. In other words, have you ever heard this? Wow, it was so crowded in church today. Or maybe it was, man, that person took my seat in church today. Or maybe something along this line. Wasn't the worship this morning in the Lord's sanctuary just glorious? I heard this one quite often. And again, this is my personal favorite. Todd, you need to get serious. You're in the church now. We behave ourselves in God's house. <laughs> so quit running. Quit playing with your toys. Pay attention. I, I think I've got a permanent indention in my head where I used to sit on the right side of my mother. And as I'd be looking around at my friends, waving at them in this long thing called church, she'd flip me in the head. Pay attention to the preacher. In fact, I found an old Bible verse. She'll deny this, so if she ever comes, don't ask her. But I found the old weather-worn, tear-stained Word of God. As I went back home from college, I was flipping through as my mother's Bible, and she'd get up early in the morning and read Scripture and have devotion, a 
very God-fearing, God-loving lady. And then I flipped open to a certain page, and there's a piece of paper, and I had these flashbacks. And it said, Todd. And then it had all these lines underneath it. And I started trembling again. And I remembered, those were the little marks that Mom would make when I would act up in church. And when I got home, yeah, spare the rod, spoil the child principle would happen. So that was my idea of going to church. And maybe that is what you understand. And many make these statements as if God dwells in a building. Now, this has further ingrained in our mind an idea that we go to church. Now, if I were to ask you this morning personally, I'm not going to do it, so don't, don't get nervous. If I were to ask you, what is church? What would you say? Think about it. What is church? What is it? Is it a place to go worship? Is it a place where we meet and sing? Is it, is it a place where we, we study the Bible? What is it? Now, let's do a little history review very quickly. Ancient Judaism and Greco-Roman paganism were centered upon three elements. The first, the temple. Secondly, the priesthood. And thirdly, sacrifice. Now, when Jesus came, he ended all three of these things. I hope you understand that. Jesus fulfilled all of those things. So consequently, the temple, the professional priesthood, and the sacrifice of Judaism, as well as paganism, were finished. They all passed away with the coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, the first followers of Christ, the early Christians, were asked by the pagans, what are you folks about? Because obviously they were living in an incredible different lifestyle. If you read in Acts, they would see a need, and they would come together as Christ's church and help. So people, the outsiders, would say, what are you folks about? What, what are you? Are you religious? And they say, no. Well, what do you do? Where do you meet? Where's your temple? They say, we have no temple. Of course, if you know history, they were meeting in the tombs, the catacombs, hiding from the oppression. They go, well, where do you do your sacrifices? And they go, we don't do sacrifices. There was once and for all the perfect sacrifice. So they didn't really understand these first Christians. In fact, the pagans said of these first Christ followers that they were atheists. Because they had no religious symbols. They had no reli religious structures. They had no religious performances. It's very interesting and very unique. It was only the early Christians who did away with all of these three elements. It can be said that Christianity was the first non-temple-based religion to ever emerge. So with that being said, the word in the scripture that talks about church in the original language means ecclesia. The word ecclesia simply means a gathering of people. Do you understand that? When the scriptures were penned, the word ecclesia meant a gathering of people. And we would say a called out assembly. Yes, we are in this world, but we are not of the world's systems. We walk and live in a different manner. So we are a called out group of people from the world's system. So whenever you see the word church, it meant, meant a group of people. Now, in the minds of early Christians, people, not structures, constituted sacred space. The Bible says, or Scripture says, we are the temple of God. I love that. The early Christians understood that they themselves corporately were the temple of God. In other words, this is where God resides. What a beautiful picture. I get goosebumps. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, so hang with me. In fact, a historian of Jesus Christ, a doctor, a very articulate, educated man, did some research. His name was Luke, and he was doing this research for a Roman official named Theophilus. And this researcher 
wrote down in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 22. He said this about this, this, this disciple of Christ, Paul. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotion, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare to you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, now watch this, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So Luke, the historian, is researching this man named Paul. Paul has gone to a pagan city, and he is looking at the idols or the effigies of the pagan's god, gods. And he found one that said, to the unknown God. The God that we don't know, but we know he's out there. And I love what Paul did. He used their culture. He used their language. He used what they understood and said, let me tell you about this guy. So then he, gets, he begins to speak about Jesus. It's beautiful. Now, can you imagine that? Here he is touching an idol. And he says, let me tell you who this represents. Pretty amazing. But what's interesting is the very end of this scripture where it says, this God of gods does not dwell in temples made by hand. Now think about this. The first coming of Jesus Christ, his name was Emmanuel. Does everyone remember what Emmanuel stands for? It means? One more time. Ready? One, two, three. Very good. Thank you. Emmanuel means God with us. That's the first covenant or the Old Testament. The New Covenant, or the New Testament, is what Jesus Christ brings in with his shed blood. And what is beautiful, as we go back, for those of you that are Christians, you understand Scripture says that when Jesus Christ was crucified, atoning and paying for our sins, many things happened. One thing being, the veil in the temple was rent in two. Now, for sake of time, I'm not going to go back into that, but I will say this. The Jewish way of worship consisted of God residing in this very special place. And you, not anybody could go in there. In fact, only one person could go in this special place. It was very, very serious. And when this one person would go in, they usually would tie a rope to him. Because if he didn't do well, he was in the presence of God and it could be bad. So it was a very serious thing, very serious time. That's the Old Covenant. What brings about the New Testament or the New Covenant is when Jesus Christ lays down his life for us. His shed blood takes away our sin. And the veil separating God from mankind. Remember, we would have to go into where God was. When Christ died, this veil was rent. Do you know what that symbolizes? It symbolizes God now comes to us. Think about that. That's huge. It's absolutely life-changing. God not only with us, but now God in us, the new covenant. Now, consequently, nowhere in the New Testament do we find the terms church or ecclesia or temple or house of God used to refer to a building. So nowhere in this new thing, the new covenant, from Matthew on, do you see where God says this church is a building or a structure. With that in mind, I would like for you this morning to shift your idea of church away from it being a building that mediates the presence of God to the world. I hope you're tracking with me this morning. Instead, church, not a building, church is what happens. Think about it. Church happens when those who follow Jesus gather together, live in unity and obedience to who Jesus is and what Jesus taught. The church is not a location you go to. It's something that we are. Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? I hope this isn't a new, a new concept. If it is, we'll talk more about this privately. I can explain it to you. Church is something that we are. Think about this. We are to be the community of Jesus. So when people see us corporately, they see a community of called out people 
that are living in this community as an advocate for Jesus Christ. I've got a slide I'd like to show you, and maybe this, maybe this will bring it home. We are to be the community of Jesus followers for our community. That's what the church is. Does that make sense? This helped me out. Very good. Yes, very good. So let's define the word church in this context. The church is people, as Faith sang this morning, broken, imperfect, normal people. People who have committed to follow this way of Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, follow me. That's all he would, he would do. He went to Levi and he would say, follow me. That's all he would say. He would come to him and say, gentlemen, I see you're fishing. Come follow me. He didn't say, okay, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. And if you get all this, check the box, then you can follow me. No, he was an incredible, incredible man, a loving man. He lived so compellingly in love that when he went to someone and said, follow me, they would say, I don't quite understand everything, but I'll follow you. So when we are those that say yes to Jesus and follow him as now our Lord, Others see something about us, and they go, we're compelled to know more. That's the community. Now, that's what baptism signifies. Lord willing, in the days to come, we'll have a baptism. And when one has said yes to the way of Jesus, when Jesus says, I am the only way, I am the way, there is no other way. I am the truth, you can trust me. I promise to be trustworthy to you. You can believe in me. I am the way, I am truth, and ultimately, I am your life. When one sees that and says yes to the covenant terms to Jesus Christ, we call this salvation. Some would say asking Jesus Christ to come into our heart. Some would say trusting in Jesus or believing. That's fine. When they see that, they are now identifying with Jesus Christ to partner with him to make a difference in this world. At the same time, they're being saved from their sins because the Holy Spirit now indwells this person and teaches them truth. The truth that... We were born in our trespasses and sins. But God wants to work in us to work through and work out our salvation. And one day we will see him face to face and we'll be completely saved. But in the meantime, in the meantime, church is not just a place where we come and sit here on Sunday morning or attend a class during the week, check the box, and that's it. And hope for the day when we get to go to heaven where we float around in the clouds and play harps with little babies with wings. That's not it. Folks, we've been called to do something. Remember, we have been called to be the Jesus community, right? It's us. To impact this community. So baptism signifies one who says, yes, I see Jesus as the only way. I see him as my Savior. I know I, without him, have no life. I have no hope. And I'm trusting in him. At that moment, salvation has occurred. That is a turning from my way, the way of Todd, to the way of God. That's what repentance is. Knowing I'm on a fast track to be destroyed, as some would say, hell. Saying that way, there is no, there's no hope. I turn from this way to Jesus Christ, my only hope. The way, the truth, and the life. From now on, I want to partner with him in community with other believers to make a difference for our community. So now when we refer to church, we refer to a gathering of people or those who follow Jesus. This means that when Jesus referred to his church, he was implying those that gather in my name. So yes, yes, we do get together. But the church is not to be focused around a building or a program. I hope that makes sense. We come together, yes, to be encouraged. Scriptures say, not forsaking yourselves, the assembly together. There's an important part of assembling together. We get recharged to go out into the, to the world for the week to make a difference. But remember, just sitting in a seat is not the end. It's not the end game. It's not the purpose of what Christ has empowered to literally shape the gates of hell. <clears throat> so yes, we come together. But rather, we are people who gather around Christ, and we replicate him to the world. Jesus says it this way. This is how the world, the world will know that you're a follower of me. 
by your love. I'm afraid in the past, and even in my journey, I was told to dress a certain way, to carry a certain thing, go to certain things, and that would tell everybody I was a Christian. But I don't see that in Scripture. That's not what changes life. That is not literally what pulls people out of this thing called hell. The love of Jesus Christ empowering us through His Holy Spirit helps us understand and become aware this person is broken. This per person is bruised. And it's our job to be Jesus to them. And as we come together, we tell each other, okay, I know of this need. I know of this pain. How can we get involved to help this person? We know this young lady struggling with this unbelievable darkness and anxiety. And I get together and say, can you help me reach this lady? I know of a young lady that's struggling with an unexpected pregnancy. Will you, will you help her? And they go, yes, that's been part of my experience and part of my journey. We connect people that have been hurt and are carrying their hurt to other people that need help. That's what shakes the gates of hell. So very quickly, let's look at two distinct factors about this early church. Number one, the people. Not the buildings, not the structures, because the first Christians had nowhere. The people of his church. They were not once considered to be holy by the people of God in that day. In fact, you look at these people that Jesus says, come follow me. I hope you read the gospel soon. Look at the people that Jesus rubbed shoulders with. Look at the people that Jesus ate meals with. They were the worst of the worst. The lepers, the outcasts, the prostitutes, the tax collectors. They were ordinary, defective people like me and you. Think of the disciples. Now, these are the early church leaders. <laughs> they were very imperfect. They were all they're struggling for power. Hey, Jesus, when we die, who's going to sit on your right side? He, I just see Jesus saying, oh my goodness. Or how about this? Jesus, the God of the universe, bends down to wash feet. They don't get it. Oh, yeah, don't wash my feet, wash my whole body. Oh, Peter, don't get it. <laughs> Imperfect people, constantly judging other people. Hey, Jesus, we know you're part. Of, we're part of your twelve, but you see these other people over there. They're casting out demons in your name. They're not with us. Can you call down fire? Jesus, guys, guys, we're missing it. No, no. If they're not against us, they're for us. Oh, okay. I love the gospel narrative because it shows me the people that God uses are a lot like me. They're not perfect. Very imperfect. And ultimately, at the end of Christ's life, where were they? These 12 that had been fed by the Master. Those 12, one of them that actually walked on water. And so forth, seen dead, raised to life. When it gets tough, when the soldiers come, when the pressures arrive, Jesus looks around and they're gone. People like you and me, imperfect. I love, again, what Luke writes in, in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, speaking of the disciples, when outsiders saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled or ordinary men, they were astonished. Why? And they took note. Why? Because these men had been with Jesus. I love it when Jesus says, Come unto me, all, the, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, broken and bruised. I'll give you rest. That is, that is who Jesus has come to rescue. Those that know the broken. Know that they're imperfect. Know that they don't fit into the societal standards. We are the ones that see the salvation very, very clearly. Remember, Jesus didn't call the religious leaders to be his church, but he called common folk. What hope. What a beautiful story. So we see the people of Jesus' church. Secondly, the purpose of of this church. This is, this is very important. And here I would submit that most people don't quite understand. So what is it that, ex what exactly did Jesus call the church to do or to be? Again, was it weekend teaching times? And those are important. What was, did he call his church to perform music cantatas? There's a place for that. Or host Bible studies so he could talk about the words of our, our, our Messiah? Or, or even better, did he call the church to have prayer breakfast? Pass out literature? Yes, those things have their place. But remember, going back to the very first text we read, Jesus Christ empowered the church 
to shake the gates of hell. Gates are a defensive mechanism. In other words, Jesus is saying, hell is going to do its best to keep you out. But your message of restoration, of resurrection, and healing is literally going to pull people from the fire. Think about that. Think about it. If we don't understand what the church is, we'll be very busy, but accomplishing very little. Remember, Scripture says, be doers of the word. Not just hearers. Yes, we need to understand. Bible study is very important. Without it, we don't have a template of what we're supposed to do. But that's not the end game. We hear to do. We hear to do the work. So, I will say this to you this morning. Be the church. Be the church. Yes, we come to this building, and it's called the church. Back we have a sign, Grace Baptist Church. But all that is saying is in this building, our people... Communing together in the name of Jesus to make a difference in this broken and torn up world. So I close very quickly with a few points. Jesus calls his church or his followers to plug in. Plug in. He is saying, abandon this empty life of chasing materialism, chasing the American dream that only leaves you empty and turn to me. Repent. Turn from that to Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and life. Jesus called people of every political persuasion to plug in. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what politics you ascribe to. This way of Jesus is so far better. And he says, come together, work together to make an impact the way that I did for a new kingdom. Remember, Jesus Christ, folks, is our only life source. New life comes through Him. Eternal life only comes through the Son of God. Turn from your way to His way. Plug in. If you are unsure about what I'm talking about, I understand some of the terminologies may be foreign if you're not a church builder. I understand that. But please, call me. Come visit me. We'll go out for a cup of coffee. We'll chat. Because this is the most vital thing you can ever hear. That God has come to rescue you. And He wants you to plug in. So Jesus calls his followers to plug in. Jesus secondly calls his church or his followers to charge up. Jesus called his followers to come out of the bondage of the kingdom of darkness to serve in the kingdom of the loving God. I love what Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says. He talks about how his church is called to make a difference. And, it, and this, is the, this is the message. This is the message. This is the doctrine of Jesus Christ. That God rescued us from dead-end alleys and dark dungeons. He set us up in the kingdom of His Son that He loves so very much. The Son, Jesus, who got us out of the pit we were in. Got rid of our sins through Calvary. Stopped the power of this sin that we would keep repeating. That's a beautiful message. And when you see someone that's struggling in this world, in the systems of this world, depressed, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know every one of us knows someone, if it's not our own being, that is incredibly depressed. Maybe someone's struggling with anxiety. This place should be a, a place where we can free, be free to open it up, up and share our struggles and talk about these things. What has happened, and I won't say at this church, but in the journeys that I have been on, Church has become a place where people become plastic. Hey, brother, good to see you. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? And inside, we're both dying. But if it could become a place and continue to be a place where we open up, honesty brings things to the surface that can be healed. And that's the message of this church. Notice thirdly, Jesus calls his church to live out. Not only to plug in. It doesn't stop there. And yes, to be charged up throughout the week, yes. And now, with a purpose, to be doers of what we've heard. Jesus called his followers to follow him and become like him. What was Jesus known for? The love of God. Incredible. Jesus called his followers to help heal the world in the way that he did. Yes, I can't touch someone and heal them. But you know what? I can tell when someone's hungry, and I can bring them groceries. 
And I can tell when someone's hurting, I can't touch them and remove the pain from their life, but I can stand with them. And I can hold their hand. We can weep together when times are rough. That's what Jesus did. Jesus calls his followers or his church to covenant with one another in community. We are a family, folks. I don't have family in this town. You are my family. There are others that are all alone. They've lost a spouse. And they come into church trying to, in the building, and try to, to, to put on the face, but inside they're this close to falling all apart. We are family. We are to be here for one another. Covenant is one of the most beautiful things I see in Scripture. Marriage is supposed to be a reflection of this covenant that God has made with us. God says, I love you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You can trust me. And he sticks out his hand. And when we hear that message, and this has fallen short, and this passion and this purpose has fallen short, and we finally see this covenant with the God of gods, and we go, you know what? I need that. I want to follow you. That is a bond that can never be broken. And may we covenant together. Yes, we're imperfect people. Yes, people will make you mad. I'm sorry. I will do some bonehead things. I'm going to say that right now. That's on the record. In the days to come, your pastor is going to make some very bumbling, stupid... I'm human. Half the time I wonder how in the world did God want me to come here to be your pastor. I'm sorry. You're stuck with me. <laughs> But the reality is, I love you, and I'm going to repl replicate Jesus to you in an incredible way. And may we all do this in community together. That doesn't mean we have to be perfect. We'll do the best we can. But when we make a mistake, and when we offend people, may we make it right. When we know we've hurt someone, may we make it right and ask for forgiveness. So Jesus calls his followers to plug in, to get that lifeline directly from God. He calls his church to charge up, to serve. Calls his church or his followers to live out. And then lastly, Jesus calls his followers to pass this on. Jesus called us to advance the kingdom of God. That's incredible. God could have done it in a myriad of ways. But he chose imperfect. The scriptures say the clay vessels. Pitiful things like you and me to do this incredible work. All of these things go far beyond what we can do on Sunday mornings, folks. What we've talked about this morning, Bible study is very important. Music is very important. But if we take away the purpose of what we've been called to be, a community of Jesus, for the community, we're just busy. It's just busyness. Being and doing the church is so much more than going so this morning, I hope you understand what it means to be the church. You know what the church is? It's you 